Hello, welcome back to the channel. My name is Jason. First off, I'd like to apologise to for the uh, audio. <laughs> I know it's not up to scratch at the minute again. Uh, I did order a microphone and I ordered the wrong one for my device. Yeah, I know. So I have got another one in, in the post, so uh, that should be coming soon. Uh, but hopefully you can hear me okay. So um, with that being said, <laughs> let's get on with today's video. Now it's only human nature that we make mistakes from uh, time to time or misconceive something. I mean for 30, 40 years I always thought that bats were blind. You know, blind as a bat, right? But turns out bats aren't blind and uh, they never have been. So I don't know where that saying comes from. And uh, now astronomy isn't without its fair share of misconceptions. So what I thought to do today for you is put together 10 of the more common misconceptions that you're going to find in astronomy. Now, when you first look up at the night sky, at, uh, at the stars, they do appear to be white. But if you stand and look a little bit closer and spend a bit of time looking at individual stars, you'll start noticing that they do actually vary in colour. Now, admittedly, the vast majority of, sta of stars will appear to be white, but there are blue stars up there, there are yellow stars up there, orange and red stars up there. Um, now, what causes this colour difference is basically temperature difference. Uh, it's how hot or cold or cool the star is. And uh, the hotter it is, the younger it is usually, and the, the uh, redder or warmer the colour is on the yellow and orange uh, side of things, is, is the older the star is and the more cooler it is. Um, now, you can think of it a little bit like a, a Bunsen flame or a, or a torch, you know, like a, a burning torch. When you first switch those on, it's a yellow flame, which is the cooler one. And when you turn up the heat a little bit, you know, or turn up the gas, the, the flame then becomes blue, which is the hot one. Exactly the same thing in nature, really. So, um, and if you want further proof, just have a look at this amazing Hubble photograph here. I mean, that's just a, a kaleidoscope of colour there. So, it's certainly, stars are not all white. There is plenty of colour up there. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. We've all heard it. We've heard it since we were kids. And when you look at the stars, they twinkle, right? <laughs> well, they appear to twinkle. In actual fact, what's causing them to appear to twinkle is our atmosphere around Earth. You see, when starlight goes through the atmosphere, the atmosphere does all kinds of crazy things to it. You know, it distorts it and refracts it, which gives it a shimmering, twinkling effect. In fact, if you went into outer space and looked at the stars, they would just look like pinpoints of static light. Stars don't twinkle, it's the Earth's atmosphere that makes them appear to twinkle. Now, this is not really a misconception. It's more in the field of asking a question. And that question is, if you were to say to somebody, how big do you think a shooting star is? But let's first clear one thing up. A shooting star is not a star. Stars don't move like that. I'll explain what it actually is in, a, in the next one. Uh, but for now, you know, how big do you think a shooting star is? Now, the questions that I, the, sorry, the answers I've got to this question over the years are from baseball size, football size, small family car size, football stadium size. And, uh, you know, very, everybody thinks that, you know, these huge, great things. In actual fact, the average shooting star that you see in the night sky is no bigger than a grain of sand. 
But the reason why such a tiny particle can uh, achieve such a light show is that it's actually traveling at round about 120,000 miles per hour and it's heating up to around about 3,000 degrees centigrade, sorry, degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it's, it, you know, this is why it, uh, it, it hitting the atmosphere at just such a colossal rate of speed that it just burns up in this intense uh, streak of light that we get across the sky. But a shooting star is usually no bigger than a grain of salt or sand. Now this is one a lot of people get wrong or mistaken. I mean, what's the difference? Asteroid, meteor, meteorites. Now it's only recently, in the last couple of days actually, I was reading a comment about uh, something somebody had put about a meteor that had been found in the desert. Now there's something dramatically wrong with that uh, comment and, you'll ex and I'll ex explain why in a short while. First, you have to understand what all three are. And to be honest with you, they're all pretty much part of the same thing. They just go through different phases. Now, all meteorites and meteors start out as asteroids. Now, what an asteroid is, basically are small bodies of rock that orbit the sun, varying in size from about 10 meters in diameter to over 500 kilometers in diameter. Now occasionally small fragments of rock and dust break away from some asteroids and float off into outer space. Now these smaller particles are now called meteoroids. Sounds painful, I know, but it's not. It's just small lumps of rock and dust, basically. Now, these meteoroids can sometimes come into the path of Earth, Earth's orbit and enter the atmosphere. Now, when they do enter the atmosphere, there's two things that can happen. One, they can burn up in the atmosphere as a streak of light, which is a meteor or shooting star, which we've already covered. Now, if that particle then can actually is big enough to get through the Earth's atmosphere and actually land to the ground, it then becomes a meteorite. So it starts off as an asteroid, it becomes a, a meteoroid, it then becomes either a meteor or a meteorite, depending on whether it lands to Earth or not. So in a nutshell, meteors stay up, meteorites come down. Now, I'm sure a few of you are screaming at your screens right now saying, but Galileo did invent the telescope. And uh, it is a very, very common misconception. In fact, a 16th century spectacle maker called Hans Lippesche or Lippehe uh, first patented the idea um, way before Galileo. Now, where the misconception comes in that Galileo invented the telescope is he actually just improved slightly on Lippershey's telescope. And also, Galileo was the first person to actually point a telescope to the stars. In other words, he was the first optical astronomer. But he certainly wasn't the first person to invent the telescope. Now, this one admittedly is a little bit of a trick question uh, because most people would say, well, telescopes magnify things. They make things look bigger. Well, in fact, they don't. What actually magnifies the image is one of these things, the eyepiece of a telescope. What a telescope's job is, is to gather light. Um, now, what happens is on a telescope is the only purpose of this lens at the front is to refract light. Same with the mirror uh, on a reflecting telescope is to reflect the light to a focal point. Now once that light is collected to a focal point this is when we insert the eyepiece and it's the eyepiece that actually magnifies the image not the telescope. You would think so, wouldn't you? It makes sense. You can see more of it. 
Well, in fact, the full moon is probably the worst time that you can point your telescope or binoculars towards. You see, what happens when you've got a full moon, whenever the moon is illuminated, that means it's in broad daylight. Now, this is going to be doing two things. One, it's going to be incredibly dazzling. It's going to be so bright to look at the full moon uh, through optical aid. The other thing is you're not going to really get any definition of detail on the surface. Um, you, and this is simply because there's lack of shadow. It's like anything, if you, um, when the sun's coming at an angle on the moon, when it's at one of its phases, this is where you're going to get a lot more definition in the craters and the mountains and just the lunar surface in general. When it's, when, when it's in direct sunlight or the moon is full, all these craters just really become little white rings. That's all they, they appear as and everything looks washed out as though you've got the contrast up too much, if you like. So the best time to view the moon is when it's at its phases, one of its phases, not when it's at full. <laughs> now, it's surprising how many people actually think this. And you've only got to think of one thing. We went to the moon, okay, Armstrong, that danced around on the moon and whatever, and we brought back space rocks and space dust. Now, if there was no gravity on the moon, then all the space rocks and space ducks would float away into outer space. We wouldn't have space rocks and space dust. And that's probably one way you can look at that it's impossible for there to be no gravity on the moon. Now, there is gravity on the moon, but it's a lot less than what it is here on Earth. The thing is, the, the, the moon is a lot smaller than the Earth, uh, but it's still a pretty massive lump of rock. And this is where gravity is achieved, because wherever there is mass, you're going to get gravity. And like I say, it's a lot weaker uh, on the moon, but there is still gravity on the moon. Now, it's pretty common knowledge that Saturn is the planet with the rings, but it does come to a surprise to a lot of people to know that it's not the only planet to have a ring system. In fact, as well as Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune and Uranus all have their own independent ring system. Saturn is not the only planet to have a ring system. And finally, probably the biggest misconception of them all. You certainly do not need a telescope or even a pair of binoculars to get started in this uh, amazing hobby. T to be honest with you, if you're totally new to the hobby and you maybe only know one constellation, then I would advise not getting a telescope just yet. Spend a couple of months learning your way around the night sky. Trust me, it's not boring. It's an enjoyable and rewarding thing to do because when you first get out there and look up, it's just like a jigsaw puzzle that you've just dumped on the table. Nothing makes sense. But when you start piecing it together and everything starts forming pictures and you start mapping the night sky, it's such a great sense of achievement. It's incredibly rewarding. And with the unaided eye, I mean, there's so much to see and do. Apart from learning the constellations, you can learn where to uh, look and find the planets. You don't need a telescope to see the planets. Um, you can see deep sky uh, uh, targets such as the Pleiades, other uh, clusters such as M13, uh, which is a globular cluster in the constellation of Hercules. There's the Andromeda Galaxy, the Orion Nebula. The list goes on, folks. There's so much astronomy that you can learn and get under your belt before you even think about buying a telescope. So there you go, folks. That's 10 astronomical misconceptions. Let me know if you're guilty of any. I know I'm, uh, I've been guilty of a few of them in the past. <laughs> Not to be ashamed of. We all misconceive things from time to time. Well, that's it for another video, folks. Thank you so much for watching if you've watched this far. Don't forget, hit that thumbs up button if you've enjoyed the video. It really does help the channel out. And maybe subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Well, in the meantime, folks, take good care of yourselves and I will see you on the next one. Bye for now.